now that Ramaswamy referred to the US-China relations, I guess that means it's really important now, right? Um, so I'm going to turn to Steve Roach to <laughs> learn a lot more about this relationship. Uh, Steve has written, as you know, a very interesting book, Accidental Conflict, which goes very deeply into d both sides of the relationship, uh, their self-delusions, <laughs> their delusions, their um, you know, problems in seeing themselves as well as the other side. So I'm going to ask you, Steve, to talk about what do you mean by false narratives and why do you use this to drive um, our, your description about the relationship. It's a real pleasure to be on a, a panel with you. I know we did a, a call a few weeks ago and uh, you had totally forgotten that we had done a panel together a few years ago, so I must have made a great impression on you then. I hope, <laughs> I hope to make a better impression this time. Um, you always make a good impression. No, I'm just kidding. The, 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 the point that I'm trying to get across is this is a complex relationship. Uh, it's a relationship that's grounded in history. Uh, it's grounded in the interdependencies that both nations have on each other. Uh, and we have benefited uh, enormously over the years from our relationship with China. They have benefited enormously uh, over the years from their relationship on us. There is a view in this country right now that the days of benefits are over, that the benefits have transformed themselves into threats. And I started thinking about that a lot maybe um, five or six years ago and, and started picking apart some of the, the perceived threats <laughs> that we have in the United States with respect to China. And I started with trade. Uh, trade historically has been the anchor of our relationship with, with China. And yet there's a perception right now that was reinforced dramatically by President Trump <clears throat> that picked up on a strain of thinking that's been around in Washington for a long time that the trade deficit we have with China, which is a big one, is responsible for hollowing out our uh, companies, uh, eliminating jobs, uh, and wreaking havoc on American communities. I've looked at trade for a long time as an economist. And, you know, uh, it rang a bell because I heard the same almost exact complaint um, in the late 80s with respect to Japan. Japan was being blamed for the carnage that was taking place uh, in the U.S. manufacturing sector. So I put on my hat as an economist and I came to the not, not very sophisticated but pretty obvious conclusion for me that countries run trade deficits uh, because they don't save enough at home to support the growth in their economies. Right, and I, I like the complementarity that you explain uh, with China saving huge amounts, what, 35% of your total income? Can you imagine saving 35% of your income? Uh, and then what, in America we save three? No, you know, maybe a little more, four or five. But that's, that's exactly the point. But when you don't save as a nation and you want to grow, you have to import surplus savings from abroad and when you do that, you have to run a balance of payments deficit with the rest of the world. And that gives rise to trade deficits with many, many countries. We want to blame China for a problem of our own making. So that was sort of false narrative number one. Yes, we have a trade deficit, but blaming it all on China, they deserve some of the blame, but by no means all of it. And that led me down the road to look at other false impressions that we have with respect to China. And they, range, they span the gamut from uh, uh, technology uh, and um, uh, th theft of um, intellectual property uh, and on and on. But as I went through this, I've, I said, wait a second, uh, this is not 
a problem that the Chinese have, that the Americans have with just the Chinese. The Chinese have the same problem with us. And that led to a, a much broader exploration of the false narratives that China has with respect to the U.S. And they're, they, they, they arise out of similar reasons, uh, wanting to blame others for problems uh, of a nation's own making. So um, I, do, uh, I do totally agree that there are misunderstandings on both sides. Uh, China wants to see the U.S. certain ways, and the U.S. wants to see China certain ways. And to uh, a, a big degree, though, a lot of it has to do with our own domestic politics. I mean, we do certain things, um, you know, sort of against our interests, mainly because there's a domestic reason, and China the same. So can you, you have an incredible case study. Uh, when you talk about under the Trump administration, uh, the USTR Robert Lighthizer, um, comes up with this so-called brilliant idea of imposing tariffs. Can you walk us through, you know, this brilliant idea, so to speak, and tell us what it really is? Yeah, he's um, an interesting guy. He's, he's got a new book out. I do not recommend it. <laughs> but um, he, he started out, by the way, as a deputy uh, U.S. trade representative for the Reagan administration in the late 1980s. And guess what he did? He went after Japan uh, and he uh, brought Japan up on charges of unfair trading practices under this once obscure provision called Section 301 of the U.S. Trade Act. And so Trump was looking for a trade advisor, um, someone handed him this guy's name, he liked his CV, and uh, he hired him on the spot and said, look, do for me what you did uh, in the 1980s. And in the summer of um, 2017, uh, Trump issued a formal order to Lighthizer saying, I want you to initiate an investigation under this Section 301 clause of the Trade Act. Report back to me in six months, and uh, we'll take it from there. And Lighthizer did that. He produced this 182-page document um, with like 1,300 footnotes. I'm probably the only person that read the document and the footnotes. And he... Um, laid out a series of charges on uh, the, the trading practices of the Chinese with respect to their unfair subsidies of state-owned enterprises, the illegal, alleged illegal transfer of, forced uh, transfer of uh, technology, the theft of human rights, uh, and on and on, and <clears throat> did not recommend at the end of that that we impose tariffs because this was just a report of his findings. And then in a follow-up, uh, did recommend the imposition of initially just uh, a small portion of tariffs that the Chinese quickly retaliated on and became large. They're still in place today. Well, so let me um, quote what Trump proudly called himself the tariff man at the time. And he says, China's paying for those tariffs um, after this is hours after announcing this new this new set of tariffs. And then he says, until such time as there is a deal, we will be taxing the hell out of China. So tell us why that is not such a true statement. Well, it's completely false. Um, tariffs are paid by importers at, you know, the, the point of uh, receipt on U.S. shores. And depending upon the leverage that the importers have in distributing their goods up and down the supply chain, those tariffs are then passed on to the ultimate consumers, companies, and um, uh, American consumers. The Chinese do not pay for the tariffs. They, they don't pay one dollar of the tariffs. They did raise a considerable sum of money with these tariffs, which, again, I stress one of the big surprises, and I write about in this book, is Biden comes into office 
and um, he leaves Trump's tariffs in place. So, you know, Trump did say many times, oh, the Chinese are filling our coffers because we have all this tariff-related money. Why wasn't the alarm raised as to, no, th you're charging the American people. Why wasn't the alarm raised? Well, there were a few of us who said that very loudly. And, um, you know, he, he had, and I guess still has a large megaphone. Uh, and truth was not really um, the objective here. It was to connect with a very popular um, political sentiment. And that really gets, goes back to your first question, which is so important to get across to a group like this. Why, why, do, why do our politicians go after other countries? Uh, why do we go after China? Why do we go after Japan? Why does China uh, feel compelled to do that? Uh, political leaders have bargains with their electorate. And when those bargains get jeopardized, even in an authoritarian society like China, uh, the leaders don't want to admit that they're responsible for that jeopardy, and so they prefer to blame that on others. And we've done that repeatedly, and China's doing that with us too. Right, right. So getting back to our discussion earlier about savings rates. So uh, as you know, uh, you mentioned in your book that the Chinese are saving at rates of 35 per uh, percent of their um, you know, income, and we are much lower. Um, what is China talk? And you talk in your book about what is China doing with all that money, all that savings, uh, and what does that mean when we don't have all those savings to do something with? Well, savings is sort of the seed corn of future economic growth. You need it to invest in uh, infrastructure. You need it to invest in factories. You need it to uh, invest in people through educational institutions and other forms of human capital investment. Uh, they've got plenty of that, the, and they use that uh, repeatedly to um, continue to grow the scale of their economy. They save to excess, though, because they don't have the social safety net that gives individuals security about their future. So they have inadequate health care and retirement plans. And families, especially families in China that are aging rapidly, feel very insecure about their social future. Uh, and so they put aside a, a much larger portion of the money they earn to take care of their uh, health care and retirement. And with the with, uh, Chinese society aging so rapidly, that motive becomes even more pronounced as a result. But you also talk about how that savings, you know, at a, an aggregate level, allows the country to invest in things that we actually have a little bit more difficulty doing. So you mentioned the space, uh, you know, exploration. I mean, there's a space race going on, and China can invest in all, all facets of that space race. Talk about some of the things that they're investing in that actually, you know, in, th puts them in competition with us. Yeah, there's, you know, that's, that's the way the world works. I mean, they do invest uh, heavily in advanced technologies, space program. They invest heavily in military outlays. They now have the largest Navy in the world. Uh, the infrastructure is um, extraordinary, especially for somebody who grew up in this town who just struggled to drive, I don't know, what, 15 miles in an hour. Um, high-speed rail, uh, and they are investing heavily in uh, a network of, um, I won't say first-rate, but increasingly impressive educational institutions, and they're investing in uh, the faculty and the laboratories they need to, uh, to build that. And so they're, they're a formidable force in converting their saving into advanced technologies. We view that as a threat. We, we feel, you know, like the Chinese announced a very controversial um, program uh, about eight years ago called Made in China 2025. And they followed that up the next year with a, uh, an Internet action plan, and then they had their uh, AI development plan a few years later. 
these are areas that we feel that we are entitled to maintain our leadership in. Uh, and we view the Chinese presence in those areas as a threat. The final thing I'll say about this is that as entitled as we feel that we are to leadership in advanced technologies, our shortfall of savings, which is the other side of this coin, makes it very difficult for us <laughs> to fund the investments in these technologies and innovations that we need to maintain our leading edge. Um, in, in many ways, though, a little competition is good, right, even if the U.S. feels that it has to compete with China, so that's a good thing. Um, I do want to pick up on your you know, um, the investment later on, but I also want to ask, you have uh, just a little diversion. You talk about military spending in China, and you have a very interesting discussion about how uh, the military, you know, on the books, it looks like China has a much smaller percentage of their GDP uh, invested in the military compared to us. But talk about how actually there's a lot of other stuff that shows that they really are investing, stepping up their investment in the military relative to us. Well, their economy is smaller. I mean, it's growing rapidly. And the, the military share of their economy uh, based on the most recent published data uh, is about 60 percent of the share of ours. That number leaves out a lot of um, outlays that they spend on internal security, Coast Guard, uh, even, even their space program. Uh, and there's recent evidence that I've seen that suggests that the, the current gap, um, China versus the U.S., is uh, probably half of what the official numbers would lead you to believe. They are growing their military spending uh, at about 7% a year. Our military outlays are frozen. They're the, by far the highest in the world. Yeah. We spend more in aggregate than the next nine countries, including China, spend together based on published data. But if you extrapolate their growth rate on military outlays into the future, and I do this in the book, by 2030, they'll be spending about the same in U.S. dollars. And by 2035, they'll be spending probably 50 percent more than us. The question that comes up in defense circles all the time is, what are they going to do with this? And is it going to be you know, aimed at um, defense or a, a more muscular uh, outward-focused, um, aggressive military strategy. And that leaves a lot of people in this country and in the U.S. Congress very uneasy. Well, there was um, some intelligence, supposedly, uh, that the U.S. got that revealed that um, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping in China, had told the military uh, to, um, it has to have readiness to take over Taiwan by 2027. So, you know, how reliable that is, we don't know, but you know, that's, that's the word. So that's, that's a little the bit rumor. scary. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a little scary. So I want to get back to your reference to AI um, and actually semiconductors in particular. I'd uh, like to talk about the chip wars. I mean, this is something that has been in the news a lot, people are concerned about. Uh, you know, um, Huawei just recently came out with this seven nanometer, uh, you know, chip in its latest phone. Uh, and uh, supposedly that chip, you know, came from China Semiconductor, Simic, and, you know, we thought, oh, my goodness, they weren't anywhere near actually executing on 7 nanometer. They were just starting, and all of a sudden they've got this chip. Apparently it has South Korean, um, uh, you know, technology in it. But, you know, if you – and so we have some restrictions on it. Um, but if you were in the White House, uh, in the administration – what would you do? How would you handle this, given all that you've written about the relationship? How would you handle this? On the one hand, you need to maintain national security for the U.S. You don't want, you know, our chip technology to, to find its way into Chinese military technology that they might then use against us. At the same time, you want to encourage, as an economist, you want to encourage trade, greater trade and commerce. Well, you touch on a lot of... Um complex aspects of the 
the tech war piece of the conflict. And I, I do have a, a chapter in the book on, on Huawei. And I, I raise a number of questions. I mean, the one allegation that is central to the point you just made is that Huawei is presumed to be a captive of the state, and therefore anything they do, we should presume can be immediately transformed into uh, military purposes. They have sort of this concept, uh, and Lighthizer's report wrote a lot about this, this dual fusion model, where literally anything they do on the technology front uh, can <coughs> become a, um, uh, a weapon uh, aggressively deployed by the People's Liberation Army. Quite honestly, there's no evidence of that. It's a presumption, it's an allegation. Uh, and Huawei, uh, which is a, uh, a large, and in many respects, very impressive Chinese company uh, that has an R&D budget, research and development, of about $25 billion a year, which is comparable to what Apple and Intel and you know, the American technology companies have, uh, we decided we want to put them out of business. And so under the Trump administration, we put sanctions on them, uh, and we crushed their smartphone business under the presumption that because they could do that technology to deliver smartphones for Chinese people, they could then convert those into uh, uh, <laughs> military use weapons. And Huawei, again, R&D focused, uh, they worked very hard in the five years that they put sanctions on to do an end around um, uh, uh, our pressure and came up with a, a smartphone uh, done indigenously with Chinese technology. And what's the big surprise? Well, I think we, the, we squeezed them and look what they did. Well, it's not clear where it came. It's possible that it also um, came from um, technology used in, in South Korea, uh, though not necessarily obtained directly from South I Korea. I don't think we have any evidence of that, Cheryl. I don't, honestly. I mean, the, the U.S. government has said we're going to study this very seriously. And there was a firm that was commissioned by Bloomberg News, I think it was called Tektronics that took the, uh, the new smartphone apart piece by piece, and as best I can tell, they determined that the core processor was made by, <coughs> at scale by this Chinese semiconductor manufacturing corporation. Possibly, possibly, they used um, the lithography equipment made in Holland by ASML, that has yet to be determined. Even if they did, so what? So as someone in the administration, what would you do, uh, you know, in terms of trying to balance uh, the need for national security and, you know, the need for commerce? The administration has made it very clear that they will do everything in their power to stop uh, Chinese advanced technological uh, progress under this sort of dual fusion threat motive. I, I personally, I'm against it. I think we need to act on the basis of verifiable evidence rather than uh, a presumption of guilt. Uh, the idea that we tactically restrict Chinese access to advanced technology it is a heroic effort on our part to stop the threat now, but it, it gives rise to strategic responses by the Chinese, such as we've just seen from Huawei. Uh, it's like putting a finger in a dike. Does it really accomplish what we're trying to do? In, in other words, the backlash is that they work harder to actually indigenously develop it. And they have. And they're continuing to do that. So would you recommend not putting those export restrictions on? 
I, I, I think that <laughs> we need to be able to identify exactly the, the nature of the threat that we are trying to arrest before we go after the tools that we presume uh, will be critical to realizing that threat. What is China trying to do uh, militarily that we want to stop? Is there really aggression coming out of China that we feel is threatening us? You mentioned Taiwan. You would probably mention the South China Sea. Uh, we need to look at those issues. Well, they also came out with the hypersonic missile that really surprised everybody in the summer of 2021. Yes. Uh, and that's the kind of missile where actually it um, actually was able to go around the Earth undetected by radar um, at the speed of, you know, sound. That's pretty good. Yeah, no, it, but unlike Russia, who has actually used the hypersonic missile in Ukraine, the Chinese have not they, they built up a powerful defense capability in many re respects, but it is a defense capability that uh, to date has not been deployed in active kinetic warfare. Right, thankfully so far. Uh, let's move to another area that you talk about very interestingly enough. So of course the Chinese have built up this uh, great economy partly because they've built up the global supply chain. I mean, they are the manufacturing you know, house for the world. Um, which means that they feel that it's time for them to, you know, uh, you know, grasp for some more political power in the world. So you have an interest interesting discussion where you talk about the question of whether or not China's economic power um, uh, should they should they now leverage it to uh, obtain greater political power in the world. And then if you, you know, on the other side, look at the U.S., our economy has been the strongest in the world. And now, relatively, though, um, uh, given the power that we wield, maybe we are a weaker uh, economy um, relative to the power that we wield. And maybe that has to shift. Maybe those two scales are shifting. Can you talk a little bit about that? From the days of Deng Xiaoping, there was a view that the Chinese um, – subscribe to, which is basically a low-profile view. The, the sloganeers called it um, hide your strength and bide your time. And China kept a very low profile in global affairs. There were a few exceptions, the Vietnam War being a notable one. But in large part, they were um, uh, relatively passive on the global stage. Xi Jinping comes into office in late 2012, uh, and he immediately focuses on China's former role as a great power that was uh, largely uh, obliterated by what is referred to as the century of humiliation, which began uh, with the opium wars in, in the mid-19th century. And he expressed the strongly nationalistic view to never, ever let that happen again. And that has been a transformative political uh, call, a nationalistic call, uh, to, um, for China to re reclaim its former position on the global stage as a global leader. And they have... <coughs> executed that through a number of initiatives that they've done. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is one, uh, becoming leaders of, or attempting to become leaders of the Global South is another. Their um, uh, adventures in the South China Sea uh, and their strong belief that uh, no one should dare threaten uh, them across the Taiwan Strait when it comes to Taiwan reunification. So he, he has been talking a very, very different um, game than uh, any Chinese leader has really since, I mean, even Mao didn't talk uh, with that type of muscularity that we're seeing from Xi Jinping right now. And we view that and others view that understandably with uh, concern and feel it's a, 
a threat that we, we need to respond to. We just haven't figured out how to respond to it. And our own military strength is <laughs> unparalleled in the world, but, um, and I write about this in the book, uh, there are a number of scholars who have looked at the rise and fall of great powers, and typically they find that the great power that overextends themselves relative to a, a weaker economic base ultimately gets into trouble. And you could argue that we may be a candidate for that. So the Thucydides trap, um, where you know the rising power is really um, a threat to the existing power, the incumbent power. Although yeah, they, there have been pe people that have called it that. That's, that's fair. And yes. people have been talking about this for the U.S., though, for a while. But maybe it just takes a long time for <laughs> the U.S. to decline, to, to right? Well, let's hope it takes longer than we think. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so you talk a lot about um, uh, how these false narratives could uh, uh, propel us faster than we think into an accidental conflict. Can you talk about that? Yeah, in a nutshell... What I argue in the book is that the false narratives on the U.S. side and the false narratives on the Chinese side are a toxic combination. Imagine sort of putting them together and call them the high-octane fuel of conflict escalation. Uh, one accusation begets another, and there's a lot of retaliation back and forth for uh, nations that act on these false narratives. And so when you have high-octane fuel circulating to the degree that it is from these politically driven leaders in both nations, uh, you've got to look at the sparks. Uh, the big spark is Taiwan, South China Sea. There's a lot of sparks flying in the U.S. Congress right now, especially we have a uh, a new uh, select committee in the U.S. House of Representatives that is very hawkish and militaristic with respect to China, threatening a lot. And it, it doesn't take much to spark an accident. We've had just this past summer a near miss of uh, two, two um, naval ships in the Taiwan Strait, near miss of two fighter jets over the South China Sea. We have no military-to-military -military communication between our two nations. I'm not going to tell you that there's a war that's going to break out, but there are a lot of legitimate concerns that, that accidental conflict could, in fact, lead to um, a full-blown kinetic war. I hope that doesn't occur, uh, and it's incumbent upon us to deal with this conflict before it gets to that point. Well, it's interesting because there were also um, fibers cut, you know, underneath uh, the cables cut underneath uh, to Taiwan, and apparently it was a fishing boat, and so who knows, that could have been a test on the part of China. Uh, that would be interesting. Uh, so you talk about this accidental conflict could lead to a hot war. Um, Let's talk about some of the solutions uh, that you also talk about. I mean, it looks as though it would be near impossible. I mean, I would hate to be, uh, you know, in the administration trying to figure out how do I avoid a hot war because there are so many things that could go wrong. But there are also, as you say, you, there's a lot of hope. There are a lot of areas where we actually might be able to push on uh, that would um, possibly lead to greater engagement. So can you talk about that? Yes. Um that's the key word, Cheryl. The word you use is engagement. Uh, right now, engagement has become a four-letter word in Washington. The chairman of the House Select Committee uh, on China is a gentleman by the name of Mike Gallagher. He's a congressman from the state of Wisconsin, uh, and he has written a number of opinion pieces this summer, this past summer, uh, featuring this notion called zombie engagement. Uh, the idea is that engagement is the reason that we're in this trap with China right now. We gave away too much, and we should never engage. If we do, 
uh, we will become the living dead, the zombies that he worries about. And he, is, and, he and a lot of other uh, members of this committee, and it's a bipartisan committee, Republicans and Democrats alike, are dead set against reengagement. I think that's completely wrong. So what I end up in the book is I may basically say three things. One, um, trust building is absolutely vital. Starting with little steps like reopening consulates that have been closed in both countries, re restarting foreign exchange programs, uh, more flights between the two countries, on and on, and then dealing with big issues of mutual importance like climate change, global health, cybersecurity. Step one. Step two, focus on mutual growth opportunities in both countries so we don't fight these trade deficit battles. We open up our uh, barriers to more cross-border investment by both nations. We're going the wrong way. And third, the, the, the point that I'm actually most excited about uh, is institutionalizing an architecture of engagement by setting up what I call a U.S.-China secretariat, a full-time organization that works on all aspects of the relationship, from economics and trade to uh, technology to subsidize, subsidies in um, state-owned sectors to the big, most contentious issues like human rights, climate, health, and, and cyber. And this would be an organization located in a neutral venue, staffed by a large complement of Chinese and American uh, professionals who is at work full time on the relationship, divorced from the, the politics that uh, is really um, uh, inhibiting uh, the reengagement right now. And I have presented this view all over the world, including attempting to do it in Washington. In Washington, there is zero interest in this. Around the world, there's a lot of interest in it. When I walked in the room tonight, here, a young woman came up to me and said she wants to sign up and work for the secretariat. So, you know, I'm taking names. Um, we need um, more engagement, and we need to have a disciplined structure of engagement that holds China accountable for things we don't like and holds ourselves accountable for problems of our own making. Okay, so I want to ask you a little bit more about this, but I also want to uh, ask you, to, to pre you, the audience, to prepare some questions because I'm going to turn to you in a few minutes, okay? So uh, I like the idea of greater engagement, and uh, I wonder about this, um, you know, U.S.-China secretariat. Um, I, how would you go from where we are now? I mean, we <laughs> literally have to come up with step-by-step step, uh, framework to get to that because we're in a place right now, and it's a real place, where the U.S. is, as you say, the Congress is just, like, not listening. Um, how do you budge the Congress uh, to toward this um, ideal? Well, look, I'm not too optimistic in getting through to the U.S. Congress right now. I mean, you, well, even you to see the what's going on. Even to the administration. Okay. Um, I mean, who's the next speaker going to be, Cheryl? Any idea? Anyone know? I mean, the administration, to their credit, um, has now sent four cabinet secretaries uh, to Beijing. Uh, and the, the, the trips have been long on ceremony, short on results. But on two of the trips, the one by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and the one by Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, they did agree to set up um, two working groups under each department. Those are small, small steps. Falls well short of any type of engagement we had in the past before this trade war, but those are the types of initiatives we need. Uh, a secretariat uh, is not about sporadic, infrequent working groups. It's about a full-time, continuous 
uh, troubleshooting effort. But these working groups, to the extent that they can begin to tackle joint problems, those are steps in the right direction, and I applaud those efforts. I mean, we've had working groups, you know, in the past. Yeah, uh, what I wonder about when it comes to a general secretariat uh, would be uh, twofold. One is um, there is an addition, additional layer of bureaucracy, bureaucracy that one can, can argue that that would be another layer of bureaucracy. The other I worry about is that how much influence could it really wield? I mean, unless it's really instituted at the top between President Xi and a president of the United States. And mind you, since Xi Jinping is forever, it's really only going to make a difference into, as to what U.S. president, who the U.S. president will be to institute this. But uh, in any case, it would have to be really endorsed from the very top for it to work. Otherwise, there would be, the secretary would have no authority, no influence, no power. Look, emp em empowerment's important, and I, I do, I've written um, uh, in the book, and I've written subsequently about this, because I, I have gotten... Uh, you know, a lot of questions. And, and I, I will admit, I've been criticized as being uh, unrealistic, uh, naive, uh, guilty of, you know, wishful thinking. Uh, and I, I will admit, you know, to, to probably all of those sins. Uh, but I don't like where we are right now. Uh, and I do believe strongly that the only way out of this uh, conflict uh, this self-imposed trap that we're in is through a institutionalization of re-engagement. Uh, and the organization that I propose does have accountability at the very top. It reports to the executive Right, so but it would have to probably be endowed by law because if you think about it, if it's an executive order, then the next president comes in and just undoes it, right? I mean, I could, you know, Trump sure, would come in sure. and just undo... It's quite possible, yeah. You, you need to make certain that when you commit to an institutionalized approach to solving a very intense transnational conflict that you, you build in some continuity to the organization. Otherwise, you know, it, it, it exists for a you know, fleeting moment in time. So in that way, it almost has to be bipartisan for it to stick. And then it's that select committee on China that becomes a very important body that can actually, presumably, if they recommended it. Yeah, the, the odds of them recommending it are a number pretty close to zero. Right, 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 right. I, I would hope that they um, do not have a role in the future design of an architecture between the United States and, and China. Because they just, yeah. Okay. Well, we'd like to open it to the audience now and take your questions, please. Okay, I do have a question about, okay, look about the histories about, you know, back to 1949, the U.S. lost to China during the Tiananmen Square, and then the U.S. government had a wishful thinking, and then the Clinton opened the China again, and then they think the China with the rapid economic growth, and they will change. But now you face the same problems, because my question to you, history tell us, do you think China is a threat or not? Threat. By threat, that means that we are fearful that the rise of China will impede, infringe <clears throat> on our own freedom, on our own prosperity as a nation. Um, I understand where the question comes from, uh, but I think that <clears throat> uh, our own prosperity and our own freedom is far more in our hands than it is in the hands of China. Uh, and <clears throat> I buy the view that many, many have expressed that, you know, our strength in dealing with international conflict must first and foremost come from the strength from within. And by the, the erosion of our, uh, and, and the fracturing of our political commitment 
to our own prosperity that has existed over the last number of years, especially, I'd say, over the last six years, uh, we leave ourselves more vulnerable to the threat from the outside. And that threat could come from China, it could come from somewhere else. If I'm ducking your question, uh, that's probably right. It's the best I can do. Uh, Mr. Roach, you talked about the potential risk of accidental conflict, and that would be a risk of not engaging with China. I wondered if you could comment on some of the potential economic costs to the U.S. if we don't engage with China. For example, in innovation in semiconductors, if our semiconductor companies are getting anywhere from 25 to 66 percent of their revenues from China, and we reduce that revenue, then how does that get replaced in terms of funding their huge R&D budgets? We are two interdependent nations. Uh, and not trying to sell an earlier book, but my earlier book uh, <laughs> did, um, it's still available, by the way, if you want to buy it, <laughs> <laughs> did talk a lot about that, that two-way trade, where it came from, and the benefits that it provided for both nations. Um, and right now, there's this sort of political finessing that's going on that we have decided to call the, the changing of that interdependency uh, refer to it not as decoupling, which is breaking the links between the two nations, but we want to call it de-risking. I'm hard, and which means that we are surgically going after the linkages and just plucking out the parts that deal with threats, perceived threats, to our national security. It's very difficult to do that. And I've looked at the numbers, and you know whether you call it de-risking or decoupling, uh, we are beginning to take apart this delicate web of interdependencies that, it, that we've built up uh, really since the, um, uh, the accession of China to the WTO in 2001. And ultimately, there's a price that we pay for that. Uh, it, it raises the, the costs of goods uh, sold to American companies. It damages, uh, you know, our most valuable company, of course, is Apple. Uh, Apple gets 20% of its global revenue uh, from China. Uh, and up until very recently, China has been hands off when it comes to uh, putting pressure on Apple. It started to do that now. And Apple started to respond to that by moving uh, the production and assembly, small pieces of it, offshore to India and Vietnam. Uh, there's a price that we will pay for that. Uh, and there is a price that the Chinese will pay for that as well. And so, you know, that's, um, these are costs of conflict that uh, will impact China, the United States, and the rest of the global economy as well, and the supply chains that are critical in delivering efficiencies are now in the process of being unwound. And if they delivered benefits on the upside, you better believe that when they're unwound, you will feel the costs on the downside. Yeah, I like your idea to establish a U.S.-China secretary very much, you know, it's an excellent idea. Uh, on, Ch on China's side, I understand you used to meet with uh, Premier Zhu Rongji in the 90s. I'm not sure if you are still going to Beijing to attend the high-level roundtable talk each March or not. I do. Uh, I, I was there last March. Oh, that's great. That's great. But on you, you on on U.S. side, I understand you are teaching at Yale. Beyond writing this book, how much more you can do to influence Washington D.C.'s 
policy making process? It's a great question. Um, I committed to this. This is my passion. I, uh, I write, I teach, I travel, I speak at great events like this. This is, um, you know, Asia Society gives you a wonderful platform to reach out and try to project your views on uh, an interested audience like yours. But I've, I've, you know, since this book was published about 10 months ago, I've probably given, um, I've lost track, uh, but over 75 talks uh, around the world uh, and um, written articles in leading newspapers and done the usual stuff on uh, TV. Uh, the, to, to a large extent, though, I feel like I'm swimming upstream in a, in a huge, huge river. Uh, the, the consensus of sentiment in this country right now is more negative on China than it's been on any country <laughs> Uh, since the early 1950s when we uh, had this <coughs> venomous red scare that um, uh, caught, the U caught up in the, in the U.S. House and the Senate in a McCarthy-like, McCarthyist uh, uh, vendetta against so many uh, uh, Americans who were accused of being unfairly members of the Ch of, of the uh, USSR Communist uh, Party. And that sentiment is, is, is alive and well again. And it's very dangerous uh, and very worrisome. And I write about that in the book as well. And so I'm determined to speak out. Uh, and there, there's a lot of pushback, I will tell you that. I feel it uh, personally, and I, I, get, uh, I get a lot of... Uh, uh, encouragement, but I, I get a lot of um, a lot of hate mail through the various social media that you're all aware of. One last question. How about Gary? So, you think that there is no possibility that China would cut off access to Taiwan and the semiconductor uh, business there for the United States? Is that what you're saying, that there is no, no possibility I will, I will, that that could happen? No, I would, do not want to go on record as saying there's absolutely no chance that, that would happen. I think China would uh, act on Taiwan if it, if it felt provoked, if it felt threatened. Uh, Taiwan is a red line for China, uh, and uh, the United States... <coughs> has clearly been willing to, to test that commitment and to uh, push China as close to that red line uh, as we possibly can. That is worrisome. If you were to take a vote right now uh, in the U.S. Congress, I think by an overwhelmingly large majority, uh, the U.S. Congress would vote in favor of Taiwanese independence. That doesn't work with respect to China. We think it does. Uh, and if we act on that, and we have acted on that, but keep acting on that, then that could, could certainly force uh, China's hand. And I think that, that is a leading concern of mine in worrying about the possibility of war. Yeah, I, I think Taiwan would be very careful of going that route. <laughs> Because of the, um, it's very complicated, I think, that the U.S. would, um, whether or not they would openly come out and support. I mean, we had some of the congressmen, one congressman, um, uh, uh, Michael McCullough, I think, um, went out to Taiwan and he basically said, uh, uh, you know, yeah, we put U.S. troops in Taiwan, which is like we've never said that before. That's just well, but U.S. policy. But President then, Biden has said the same thing. Well, he then then, then it gets walked pushed, back. Yeah. yeah, it gets walked back. So when when pushed, he said, "Well, I was responding to a question because some reporter asked me, would we put U.S. troops in?'" So I mean, in other words, I think that they want to support Taiwan because they feel that Taiwan is being bullied and uh, Taiwan has this uh, Taiwan semiconductor. But on the other hand, I think that people are going to be very careful. 
um, you know, trying to cross that red line. One question that if I have two seconds to ask, why do you think the US is so less, you know, um, uh, you know, less hateful of Putin compared to China? I mean, it just seems like <laughs> we've seen uh, Russia be much more aggressive uh, and, you know, commit atrocities. China hasn't done anything yet. Except in- Yeah, no, that's, I mean, look, I think, Putin would not win a popularity contest, but but you're right. You're right. Um, we we perceive China itself as a much greater threat, Cheryl, than we do Russia. Despite you know the, the devastation that that Russia is exacting on uh, the innocent people of Ukraine, China is a full blown economic threat perceived to be a full-blown economic threat to our prosperity and to our future. And that's a, a big difference in the minds of politicians and in the, you know, the, the hearts and minds of Americans who are feeling economic pressure today. And there are plenty of them. And it's, uh, say what you want about Donald Trump. He was very effective in selling the idea to disaffected American workers that they can blame that on China. And his trade war resonated with that feeling and it still does today. And Putin, despite his, you know, his diabolical intentions uh, and his disregard for humanity does not pose his country and he does not pose nearly the type of threat uh, to the economic insecurity that eats away at the heart of American workers and voters. Well, let's give a big hand.